Okay. Um, right here, uh, this Shiv, um, so me and Shuring uh, and Jim have been working on the Kiverno project, which is like the uh, uh, a policy management uh, framework, which is Kubernetes native. So just as an overview, in the first half, I'll just run you over what Kiverno is, uh, how it really works, uh, a few features. And in the second part, we'll go over the demo and some best policies that we feel are the best practices and that are helpful. Uh, we'll give them a couple more minutes. Uh, should I wait or can I continue? Um, go ahead. Okay, cool. Awesome. So, AJ. hello. We're, we're waiting for the uh, people who wanted this meeting to, to join. I think they lost, Napoor said she thought they lost the room in San Francisco. So they're probably on the hunt for any room. Uh, I think it. Okay, just a minute. Uh, please go ahead. Okay. All right. Uh, should you wait for others or you just continue? I mean, uh, you can continue. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so now, why did we make Kiverno? So the uh, idea behind using Kiverno was to have a framework that allows you to write policies and the whole experience of writing policies is easy. It's simple. Um, we didn't want to add any new uh, language that you have to learn, but to use simple YAML based constructs to um, write some policies. Uh, second is you want to have, you want to support uh, CRDs. So you want to write a policy on some new CRD that you add and you want to operate on it. Plus, how do you want to do uh, the notification? So we are basically using events, CRDs, uh, and all the components which are pretty much native to uh, report all these uh, the results from the policies. So that's, so if you see on the left, we have the resources. Now on a resource, you can either validate a resource, mutate, or you could use a generate to basically use like on a namespace creation, I want to create like a config map or a net default network policy. And what it, what we do is we you leverage the admission control, the mutating and the uh, validating web hooks, which basically intercept the request. And then based on the policies that we have, we evaluate it and okay, should we, um, if the policy satisfies, if the resource satisfies the policy, we go ahead and continue. Uh, creating the resource. If not, we can block it or run it in an audit mode. And all this information, if it's blocked, created, is um, you can see it as an event or also as a new CRD called uh, violations. So next in, so how does a Kiverno policy look? So at the top level, it's just a policy. It's just a set of rules. So it's a list of rules and you can have three types of operations. Either you can generate mutate or validate and this operation is to be performed a resource so you can specify in the resource section like what kind what are the different kinds of resources that you want to specify the names uh, if you want to use any or use wildcards or selectors so all these are again we are leveraging all the native constructs that we have now going into the first operation mutate so there's two options either you can directly specify a json patch saying that go ahead and do this particular mutation or you could use an overlay. The idea behind overlay is you use a few, it allows you to define anchors. So like if a particular key is defined at the value or if it's not defined, then add a value. So that's how we use the if then or if not defined, which is what I went to. Now the validate, which is, uh, Basically, you're defining an overlay, which is saying that in this case, I am supposed to have a particular label called app out there. And then you can define patterns, use operators, and there's a few more options. You can define more, uh, use anchors to complicate uh, you know, additional stuff. Next is generate. And the idea behind generate is you see a namespace. In this example, you see a particular namespace being created. I want to create a network policy but this policy also checks that for an existing resource. So 
when this policy is applied, you want to check that, okay, this particular namespace, does it have this policy? Does it have a network policy called deny all traffic? If it does have, does it share the same metadata or not? So that's what generate allows us to do. So this was just an overview about Kiverno. Now we added a few new features. So basically the reporting main, one of the major features was how do we report? So now we have a separate CRD called policy violation, which we use to identify which particular resource or which policy is basically uh, violating at this moment. So this can be used by any framework to see right now, what are the active violations in my system? And it's a, it's basically shows that the active violation. So the moment you go and correct your resource or modify your policy, this is basically going to go away. Then things like, um, dynamically registered, deregister webhook. So if you don't have a policy, we don't need a webhook configuration present out there. And a few things like add statistics uh, to see how much time does your policy really take. And then we also added any pattern to, if you want to use an or operation on multiple rules. So, and a few more anchors, which I'll be going over next. So policy violations, again, like, you have a policy uh, saying I cannot run as a non, uh, you cannot have a pod with non uh, root users and you create a pod with a root uh, non root users. Then you have two options. If you're running in the audit mode, we would allow you to create the resource, but we would also create a violation object, which basically says that, okay, there is something which is not violating or you could run it in an enforce mode which basically is uh, blocking the request. So it's like a, you have an option to choose. You can either go in a strict form or um, in an audit mode. Um, and again, these are, again, the policy violation is an active violation in your system. So the moment you remove the policy, the violations are gone, or even the resource. Um, if the resource on which the policy was, we uh, kind of monitor them and clean it up. So, so this is basically how a policy violation really sees. So you have a violation which says I, this particular violation is on this policy and this is the particular resource that basically violated my policy. And you see that, uh, the, we have resource owner. So the policy which created this violation is the owner and, uh, we internally do the cleanup if the resource gets, uh, removed um, similarly um, now the situation we ran into is if you define a policy on a pod and you block the pod now whom are we gonna notify so the idea was to identify the resource owners so if my pod is blocked the object is never created I cannot create a violation or an event on it so I identify my owner for that particular um, resource and that owner has a violation saying that one of your child object has blocked so that you it's a way of notifying uh, what's really happening inside um, then other than that small um, numbers for us on the policy side we keep a track of how much time did it take for you to uh, process this policy how many uh, times it was applied, how many mutations it did, validations it did, um, and the violations that it created. Uh, that's uh, this thing. And then there's the any pattern. So the idea behind any pattern is you just, you don't need to define one rule, one kind of an operation in a rule, but you could say that either one of them, like an or condition, which is uh, satisfied. And that's my, uh, particular rule. Now coming to the validation patterns, this is something which is pretty, uh, which is like our core. So the conditional uh, anchor that you see in the example, which says that if your image type image is latest, then the image pull policy cannot be if not present. So that is basically all you define in your policy. Uh, we just, uh, you don't have to use any regular express, uh, new language to define it or for example equality you want to say i don't want to use my path warlib to be used so 
you can use an equality anchor which says if you have a host path defined then it cannot be this particular uh, path or an existence the existence is uh, to be used on a list type which says that i want at least one container to be of type nginx uh, so and if you have multiple containers it does a uh, one is to n check or you could have a negation if you really want to be like i don't want you to define any host path out here so you can have a condition saying that don't define a host path out here using the negation uh, option so this is basically what kiverno has now kiverno runs in two forms it also one is the um, admission webhook where each incoming resource is looked at and policies applied on it but it also runs as a scanner so there's the controller which keeps running in background to make sure that all the policies that you have applied right now are working or not or if there's any change happening so it's just not at the admission part it does both the pieces now uh, now next uh, we would be getting into a bit more details with the demo and the best practices and shooting will run us over all right uh, thanks chef this is shooting here and we have seen the new features or the enhancements we added recently to Kiverno. And also we came up with a set of best practice policies that we recommend the user to uh, create as the default policy to your cluster. So this type of policies that covers most of the policy security, uh, pod, pod security policy, and also it helps you to set up the multi-tenancy environment in your cluster. And it is ready to use. Also we have the additional policies which are also recommended, but it may require the additional configurations to be deployed. And uh, I have a list of the policies here. Let me just pull up the GitHub page and it'll navigate us to the explanations. So since I will have a demo later, um, I'll skip the installation for now. So here you go. This is the list of best practice practice policies we have. Simply as Shiv described, you don't want to create a container run as a root user. And if you click on this link, we have the detailed explanation. And look at the, if you look at the, uh, how the policy is, we define the validate rule here using the any pattern keyword, which means um, because in Kubernetes, you can define the security context either at the pod level or in, on the, inside the container. So in this case, um, one, if one of the spec or the validate rules is met here, we're gonna say this policy is passed. So it helps you to just simply check the uh, container without, this, without running as a root user, right? And for other type of uh, security contacts, we also have this disallow host network or host port and disallow the host pit and the host See, it's all defined in a similar way that you can define, uh, you set the security context. And there's one other interesting use case is to disallow use of bind months, which basically means whenever you have a pod using the volume type as host pass, we're gonna disable, we're gonna deny this request, right? So if you take a, take a look at the, how the policy is defined here, we use the one of the feature we support in the validation rule is called negation anchor. So we're checking this host pass is not specified in your resource manifest, right? Let's go back to it. And also just simply as you can uh, configure your trusted image registries or to disallow use of latest image tag, right? Also, to configure the health check for your workloads or the resource configurations of your the source memory or the request limits of your uh, workloads. And one other interesting rule is using the generate rule to generate a set of defaults whenever you have a new namespace set up, right? So this policy is using the generate rule says whenever you have a new namespace coming in, I'm going to automatically, automatically create these default network policies for you, which is to deny all traffic inside the namespace, right? 
Also, you can use the generate policy to create a bunch of like uh, default res resource quotas and things like that. It's uh, pretty useful. And for this additional policies, we allow to limit the use of node port services. Also, you can configure the Linux capabilities. Feel free to check it out and uh, play with it a little bit. All right, and uh, let me just run you a live demo. So here I'm gonna create, I'm not gonna show you two types of policies. One is generate policy, another is validate policy. So in this generate policy, as I have shown you before, we're gonna create a new namespace and it'll create the uh, default network policies for you. So let's go to my cluster. I have a three node cluster set up with version 1.15.1. And uh, first, I'm gonna, uh, okay, let me go back to the installation page to show you how to install a, install Kubernetes to your cluster, right? So now I don't have a Kubernetes running, which is inside the namespace Kubernetes. So let's create one. It'll install all the manifests for you and let's verify that it is running. If you go inside the Kubernetes namespace, there's a deployment created and we can see it's running now, right? So let's first, uh, let's create our first policies, sit inside, samples, best practice, required default network policies. Okay, and let's check the policy is actually created in the cluster. All right, and then I'm gonna create a new namespace and this policy will automatically generate the network policy for me. Let's say I create a new namespace called demo. Okay. And inside this namespace, I'm gonna check network policy. Right, so we can see there is a default network policy, which is to deny the ingress traffic. If you wanna take a look, this is what we defined in the policy. It's the same like here, right? And next one I'm gonna show you is the validation policy, which uh, we will have the policy validation created. So in this case, I will set the validation failure action to enforce, which means whenever there's a new admission request coming in, I'm gonna block this resource creation. So for the resource I have here is a deployment with a pod template, which is to create Nginx container, right? So in this case, my policy is applied to pod. So you will see the policy violation gonna be created on the owner of this pod, which is this deployment. So, and create the policy. What's name? All right. So before that, let's check if, so I, I have some existing workloads. Let's check if there is any policy violations created. All right, so take a look at the final phone. I can see for this pod inside this namespace, I have a, I have this pod validate some of the po policies I have, right, in this deny run. Uh, for this deny run as non root user. And also let's create the new resource to the cluster, it, which is a deployment. So, first delete this one. Let me use force delete. Okay, so I'm cleaning this namespace. Let's create the deployment again and check, right? So here you can see we have zero out of one is ready. And if you get the pod, you get nothing, right? 
So in this case, we're blocking the creation of this deployment um, of this pod. So there should be a policy violation reported um, in order to check it. Okay, this is the recent one, most recent one. So you can see in the resource block, we have this deployment. And in this manage resource, we see this pod in namespace default creation is blocked by the resource, uh, by the policy. So in order to uh, list the policies, uh, policy violation in another way, you can also use the label either by listing by the policy or the resource it creates on, right? Okay, this is the demo I have. Let's go back. All right, and also we, we plan to release GA in the near future. And these are the main features we left uh, before GA. One, the first one is querying the existing cluster resource or the configurations. So, for example, uh, in, some, in, in some of the rules, you may want to define that you only allow a single type of service. Maybe it's, uh, for example, it's a load balancer. You, only, you will only want to want a single load balancer existing per, exist per namespace. So it requires the queries for the existing uh, cluster resources. And also another enhancement we want to do is to improve the policy performance as much as we can. So this we're considering to add the policy cache while we are processing each of the requests. And also in the roadmap, we have these uh, features we want to add it in the future. The first one, since we have the generate rule, now we can generate the defaults for you automatically. But in the future, we may also, also want to maintain the resource that are generated by the policy. So for example, if you clone some existing resource into a new namespace, whenever this original resource is changed, we want to automatically sync the states to the cloned resource, right? And uh, for the access user information in rules number two and number three namespace policies, this is related to how, how you configure your multi-tenancy cluster or the virtual cluster, right? So in the admission request, we may want to extract the user info or the group info, and then based on those information, we can decide what kind of validation or the mutation rules we want to process. For the Prometheus exporter, um, since we, also have, we already have those stats, available in the policy status um, with the Prometheus exporter, we are allowed the third party to make use of them, right? And also for the command line two, which allows the user to test the policy locally without actually apply a policy to your cluster, right? You can mimic the behavior when a policy is applied. It's more like a dry run for policy. Okay. So uh, in the demo, I've shown you how easy you can install Kiverno. So please feel free to try it out and uh, import the best practice policies and give us your feedback. And also, if you have any particular use case that you want the Kiverno to support, we can, we're, we're, hap we're happy to help with it. All right, is there any questions? I guess, yeah, just to get the Q&A rolling, I, we, there was a question today uh, regarding which particular uh, policy framework to use. So the ones that was mentioned was KRail, uh, Gatekeeper, and Kiverno. So let me just give like some overview about how they are different from an implementation perspective. When you're talking about KRail, KRail is, uh, uses, again, leverages the admission webhook, but the policies are defined you have to write policies so they are like a go code you implement if you want to add a new policy you pretty much need to compile it again so that's um, how kerel functions then we are left with gatekeeper and um, kiverno so 
Phil, just talking about Kiverno, so it's not just leveraging the uh, admission webhooks, the control when a request comes in, but it also makes sure uh, in its controller that all the policies are being applied. So it's not just at the start. So it's like a monitoring scanner that runs all the time. Now, if we want to differentiate between Gatekeeper and Kiverno, the biggest uh, differentiating factor would be the, the simplicity in writing a policy. So the idea behind Kiverno was to allow users to just write simple YAML and use very minimal constructs to add conditions, simple if then conditions or operators, because that's what mostly used. While Gatekeeper requires you to use uh, leverages on OPA, which in which you define your policy in Rego. So if you have to define a policy, you need to learn Rego, and which, in my experience, has been a bit, which, is, which could be a bit tricky. So that's I think how these three uh, compare. But if there's any more questions, we would be happy to answer them now or even on the channel. Sure. I've, uh, I'll start with some questions. Uh, I really like there, there's a lot of good ideas. I think in this. Sorry, my dogs in the background are getting a little crazy. But uh, yeah, I, I noticed one thing. I was like, oh, you have cluster policies. Wonder when if people are going to ask about policies. So it seems like that was on your roadmap. Like one thing I did really, I noticed it has a really smooth like cute cuddle experience, it seems like. Uh, I was, I think a lot, most people would have probably made the violations and put them in like a config map or something, but the experience of just writing like cute cuddle get cluster violations was really smooth. So I really liked that, those ideas that you brought to it. My question is what kind, one of the things is there's a lot of good ideas. How is that interacting with people's experiences in the real, real world? Uh, what kind of, do you have heavy users or what sort of usage do you have out there in the wild or community engagement? Um, so to answer that question, so Kiverno is like, um, we have had a couple of people um, use this give feedback and they obviously helped us identify a bunch of bugs which basically led uh, to uh, for us to create these features but coming to the engagement um, in Nirmata which the platform that we have we use uh, Kiverno to define policies uh, like best sec best uh, practice policies and all so we have integrated this into Nirmata solution as an add-on where you could pretty much like use the Nirmada application and use it. So it's still in the initial phases, but people are starting to use it. And the, again, as you mentioned, the, the feedback that we have received till now has been uh, twofold. One is definitely uh, the experience is simple, which is what we aim to do in, uh, to keep it really simplistic, Kubernetes native. And the second feedback I would say is something which we have in our plans is to see how we can really profile it, make it improve it much more because we use the admission web hooks and that's like a bottleneck. So we have to be really quick. We can't really take much time. So yeah, that's the feedback we have received till now. And uh, there's another interesting discussion in multi-tenancy work group is uh, on how you set up a secure a multi-tenant environment, right? It's more like how you configure the namespace or or you can call it virtual cluster. So with uh, Kiverno policies, those are the uh, uh, best practices help you to set the security context and, and to make your cluster or the ten tenant namespace more secure. So that's one of the intent Kiverno trying to solve. I might have missed this. What status, or is it the project part of the CNCF or anything? Has it gotten a security review? Not yet, and we are not part of CNCF as of now, but. Yeah, I think with more usage, this is Jim, uh, we definitely would love to, you know, sort of 
um, submit this as a sandbox project. Uh, but I think we want to get to GA, want to improve our usage, have more folks give feedback, uh, and then definitely we would love to do that. Well, so I, I have a question on that. Um, from a TOC perspective, and, and this is not a criticism of, of what you have or, or an endorsement of any other solution, but the, the TOC has essentially already endorsed OPA as a, as a project. Do you think that there will be uh, room, for lack of a better word, at the TOC level, not at the marketplace level, not at the user community level, but at the TOC level? Right. They have to. Uh, I think the. Uh, sorry, I don't represent Nermata, but the TOC has already explicitly stated and already has multiple competing solutions around the same domain problem domains right. and several occurrences. So I wouldn't necessarily look at that as a blocker. And, and just out of curiosity, have you talked to the TOC around around that type of? Not the current members, but the last year's members definitely took the view that they're not key makers, uh, that they will welcome multiple choices around the same domain if it had, meets the TOC, if it meets the incubation and sandbox requirements around a given project. Yeah, I would imagine that there's at least supposed to be neutral in some sense. Not to say that integrating with more projects doesn't help your chances sort of but and do you see any way of sort of integrating of making it an and rather than an or in terms of things like the gatekeeper project yeah, that's a good good point right and one of the things i think we have talked about um, a few months ago is if there is a mechanism to be you know sort of extracted out so if you look at Gatekeeper, if you look at Kiverno, or if you look at you know even uh, the other was it K, K, K Rail, right? Um, so all of these, of course, share a lot of commonality, and it would be interesting to extract that out as a common framework for building policy engines. Now, how Kiverno policies are defined there uh, in YAML as overlays and as patterns that we talked about. OPA uses Rego and you know, and you know, maybe others will use programming languages, but that should be fine if there's some common mechanisms for getting the inputs into the policy engine and then the outputs. So that could be an interesting effort, I think, within this working group. Uh, if there's interest in trying to standardize uh, what would any policy engine require, and then um, you know, allowing folks to write different policy engines, even like maybe if I want to write a policy engine in JavaScript, as long as I can receive you know, events and um, output things into the Kubernetes API controller, I should be able to do that. Yes. I think, well, go ahead. No, I was just saying, I'm, I'm super interested in that effort. I think one of the things that has held us up from implementing some sort of generic policy engine was, you know, that it was premature optimi you know, abstraction. So now that we have more than one project, I think we could move towards something like that. I'm super excited about that idea. Go ahead, Robert. Yeah, well, uh, okay. we actually had um, Falco uh, last week come on to give a presentation. They're, they're leading something called the runtime policy interface as essentially that abstraction, that API that would become essentially the, the common policy engine interface. Um, not, not that you know, there's, there's not room for lots more ideas there and, and refinement, but I think that I would definitely be supportive of investigating a version of an interface that, that all policy engines could standardize around. And then yes, absolutely don't lock in a particular language choice. So if you like Rego, use Rego. If you like YAML, use YAML. If you like JSON, great. Um, but as long as everybody abides by the same inputs and output contract, then kind of standardize that at the you know the API server level, if you will. I would be feel somewhat cautious about that approach. Uh, common abstractions become least common denominators. We already have one of those in the form of a admission controller. Uh, Falco, as an example, is doing syscall filtering. Like that's a very different world than you know validating you know, YAML manifest. Um, and so trying to- No, 
don't think he was saying that we would use the runtime interface as the common one so much as take what and do something similar. Is that yeah. clarify that point? Well, throw it all the, I mean, let's get all the ideas out there, but I think the notion of having an API level interface rather than having multiple different um, kind of bolted on uh, approaches, I, I think there's benefit in it. Yeah, and there uh, like might be a unified API, but at different level. Uh, I had a well. question in regards to the continuous uh, validation on uh, Caverno. Uh, what is the sort of the basis for that? So there's an event stream through web, web emission controller, and then there's also what a periodic check. Like, what is the continuous enforcement based on? on net existing so, so what we have it's a policy controller which is like a reconciliation loop which runs in for your resync time and make sure that the policy and the resources are the active or not so it's the same thing like a deployment so a deployment controller keeps checking if uh, during its control loop to verify all the pods and the replica sets are valid or not. So this is basically what we do. So we want to verify in our controller that we take a policy, we apply on our resources. Okay, is there any change? No change, cool, we are good. So that's basically just keeps running in the background. Is there any notion of sort of integrating it into like a CI pipeline or like as far as the taking the reconciliation loop out of a Kubernetes control loop and putting it into you know, a Jenkins CLI validation of uh, check-ins the one answer to that would be running it as a reconciliation loop we have we already have the interface to watch all these objects so every time we are notified that there's a policy being added removed or anything we can immediately react while uh, and it's really fast but the moment i remove it out into some other pipeline we are looking at a delay so if there's any change happening, I'm calling in a Jenkins pipeline, which does some checks and returns the result back to me. Well, this is all. Like, so the, the context of the question is, is yes, one can detectively remediate something that's in a Kubernetes cluster or potentially correctly with a web admission controller. But before it actually gets committed, can we look at it and evaluate what's as a pull request check to validate, validate that that is sort of compliant to policy. I think one thing I've noticed is that this is a place that can be difficult to bridge how the vendors are developing from the users. So it, as someone who is implementing their own cluster, I probably would think first of putting my kind of policy checks and having everything go through some kind of CD, CI CD pipeline, right? And then you have a very controlled, there's only a few people who you know are making changes to your cluster and you have a gate that you can put right there. And that kind of works well. From the vendor's perspective, like for instance, when we're developing OpenShift, you don't have that kind of control. You can't tell people what CI CD pipeline to use. You can't control who is going to be changing the cluster. You want to enable more dynamic changes through for things like operators. And there isn't even really the bare minimum easy, like we verified a signature <laughs> basically for this change. Uh, natively in Kubernetes right now that would make that kind of fit in easier. So I think that's why if you want to kind of ship a policy framework sort of, it's much, it makes more sense to put it more integrated in the cluster level rather than the CICD. That's Absolutely. what my experience has been. Absolutely agree that that is a more general purpose solution. There's advantages to both and I'm just trying to understand the capabilities of the system. Yeah, so one, one Two things to say on the, on that point. Like one is, um, I think Shiv mentioned that you could have uh, policies either in the audit mode or enforce mode. So if you switch a policy to enforce mode, of course, then it will just show you the errors um, during admission control, and you would not be able to deploy uh, by a resource which violates a policy. Um, if you put it in audit mode, it will allow the resource to be created and to be run in Kubernetes, and then it will give you the policy violations, which you can then deal with in a more passive manner. 
I guess for like a CI solution, I think you would need like a dry run option. Exactly. Yeah, and that's where the CLI that uh, Shooting was talking about, that's on our roadmap. We were envisioning we could use the CLI to do that. But you would still have a cluster because we would need to know the uh, versions of the API objects, et cetera. But we could validate that the policy, so we could do two things. One is make sure that the policy itself is valid, right, before you put it in the cluster. And secondly, you could apply it and see what the results would be in that cluster. So that, that's why we were thinking of building a CLI to, which you could then use as part of uh, perhaps in your CI CD pipeline to achieve what you were thinking of, Kapil. Does that, uh, do you think that would work or would it be anything else required? Uh, I think that, I mean, broadly covers it. I think there is, in some cases, there's always contextual questions with regards to evaluating a policy, but I think that will effectively. Um, address uh, uh, a lot of use cases. Okay. Do you have any more questions? I, I might have missed it. Uh, sorry, I joined late. But so, apart from admission controller uh, capabilities, can you? Are you actually writing, able to write policy with like the RBAC or some big access review type level where you can like deny operations based on the user or, or creating things that based on what groups they're in, what role? Yeah, so currently, no, but that is again another, that's the feature we, uh, one of the features on our roadmap where based on users or user groups, we would be able to either apply policies or have different conditionals. Um, so today, most of the use cases we're seeing tend to be either at the namespace level or resource level, but would love to you know if you have some use cases where- Hello. Kids happen. We're making the kids cry. Okay. Uh, yeah, if you in mind, you could, you know, maybe uh, send us the message on, on GitHub. I uh, would love to learn more about those. Well, thank you for presenting it. It looks like a, a great project. I've been trying to follow it for a while. Uh, I was curious if you, as far as your experience with usage, uh, do you find more people using customize versus JSON patch on mutate? Yes, definitely. We're seeing customize and even um, you know, compared to some of the other approaches to managing YAMLs, customize seems to be more popular, which is why we emulated the overlay style of applying policies. Okay, so yeah, would love to, you know, I, I guess continue the conversation, feel free to reach out on GitHub, Slack, and certainly as we, you know, are, maybe perhaps we could do another presentation when we're at GA. Uh, we have a few things to finish, but uh, definitely looking for more feedback and if there's any other major items you feel are necessary for GA. Thank you so much. We'd love to hear back when you get to GA. It'd be great. All right. uh uh, sorry, I was just going to ask a question about uh, KubeCon coming up. Uh, is there a, a policy SIG uh, meetup in person at KubeCon? I am the only one, I think, right now who is scheduled to go. We could organize one. Not. There's also a, like, meet the SIG thing. I know that they're organizing. 
I okay. don't, I'll, I'll have to look up when that is. Will people here be going as well? I was actually I considering, be. I was actually considering maybe not going. So, <laughs> I, it, but if there's a lot of good conversations that I'll be missing, then I'll, I'll, I'll try to make it. Yeah, I'm probably going to be there. I, I have to firm up my schedule, but <laughs> I have a couple of conflicts I'm trying to resolve. So TBD on that. Uh, okay, uh, I'll be there. Uh, if there's uh, any polycystic stuff there, I guess just put it on the, uh, the shared calendar and uh, happy to attend. Uh, and if not, then catch uh, everyone at the next meeting or on Slack. Cool, we'll do that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Did we have yeah. did we have other items on the agenda? Yeah, anything else? I was agenda just... or we should we uh, wrap well, up? Well, I today? I just want to I mean it kind of tails off the end of the the conversation we were just having but I, I think uh, you know based on the conversation we had with Michael Ducey last week around the the runtime policy interface you know where do we kind of want to go with that? I mean not in necessarily in terms of that particular proposal but you know, in the decision tree of, uh, you know, is that a good idea? And, and we got some good feedback just now, that, you know, maybe that's not a good idea. So I guess, how can we codify that or, or more formalize that into a decision framework of, is, is there, are there pros and cons for having a, an interface defined? If yes, then next steps. If no, great, publish some, some position statement, if you will, on why this is not a good idea. Is there an actual proposal around the runtime interface? Uh, yes, uh, Falco has put one out there. Uh, yeah, you can find it on the meeting note. Or I just linked it in the chat. Oh, cool. Is there a separate implementation? Like I know they were looking at re like they have a custom kernel module for a few years. Uh, they're looking at re-implementing on eBPF, which they may have done by now, but. I believe uh, they've done, yeah, I believe they've done the eBPF already. I think that this was their attempt at their internal cleaning up and then they were kind of publishing this as, hey, this was a good best practice for us, maybe we should do this more broadly. Yeah, my, my only question, concern about codifying standards is if it's only a de facto implementation, in which case, let's just call it that. Um, if there's multiple things that are, projects that are interested in the space that are willing to go to that same standard, then it's more of a standard. True, true. I guess I was asking the more meta question of, and, and I think you even said uh, maybe it's not even a good idea to have a standard because the abstractions are so idiosyncratic to different problems. So I was more concerned about the policy sig trying to take the same standard over from as a overreaching one fits all from OPA and Caverno to Falco when they represent fundamentally different things. Um, you know, if there's a separate runtime spec and I haven't read it, so I, I, I'm ignorant. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a separate yeah. runtime one. I think uh, we can kind of divide, and I don't think we would want to necessarily or at all mix the several kind of topologies that we're dealing with. The Kubernetes like admission and API topology is the one that we would like talk about yep. when we talk about uh, Gatekeeper or anything else. The runtime yep. policy is a different one, and maybe yeah, the they could use similar like language but I, I, yeah i think that would be definitely overdoing it to put those together if you look at the standards that have been successful in the ecosystem they've been on the basis that there are multiple implementations and then we're extracting out a standard if we're just doing one for a single vendor i'm, I'm cautious just on the basis that we don't necessarily know how generic or applicable it is to other implementations of the same I missed Again, that this meeting, so I I would I'm gonna have to watch the video to before well, answering for anything on the runtime interface. I, I, well, actually, the funny thing is, I, it was just Howard and I who, for whatever schedule reasons, could attend. So we we basically deferred the full presentation anyway. So that gives us an opportunity to reschedule with everybody here who's interested. Uh, had we had this audience, we would have actually had a great presentation. But <laughs> since uh, scheduling wasn't great last week. Um, 
he, he deferred. So he's happy to come back. I think we just have to find a, another scheduled date and uh, we can ask all these wonderful questions. But just to follow up, Erica, what were you were saying, I, I think what I'm, what I'm suggesting is, you know, is it the appropriate time, and the answer might be no, to, to kind of create that taxonomy of what the different, you know, policy abstractions need to be, and, you know, where are the boundaries between those abstractions that make sense without, um, I, I just, I sense that there's, there's, there are, you know, multiple vendors, but then there are just multiple uh, domains, some which overlap, some which don't, there's pod security policy, there's OPA, there's, Falco, and then you know, everybody kind of looks at the problem in their very small slice of the world and throws out their, their interface or their idea of what the policy spec should look like. And then you know, everybody just kind of re-implements the wheel. My instinct would be that the step is to kind of coalesce some of this, the, different, the differences and similarities and kind of somehow so that we can look at it broadly enough to see if there are points that make sense to at least just kind of standardize or say that yes it makes sense or we will allow certain things even if it's as simple as like does it make sense to say that like, all of these objects can go in the policy group in API yep Makes sense. Yeah, just looking at the runtime you know, proposal, the RPI proposal, it seems like they, they are trying to standardize on how policies would be invoked, but then there's also some concept of policy violations. So maybe, maybe even starting with something which is perhaps uh, if all of these frameworks can output a policy violation in a standard form, even just that would start having some benefits, right? Because independently of its framework you're using, then you could have standard tools to inspect and manage policy violations with some information on what resources and or resource owners um, have, have caused those violations. That, I, that sounds like a cool place to start, sort of like, the Prometheus metrics. Sorry, now I have my puppies going through. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, so it's just capturing the outputs in that case, and maybe we defer the inputs to, you know, to uh, until where there's more, um, I guess, more work with some of these frameworks and more usage. Yeah, I, I like that, and especially from the compliance side. You know, if you're the if you're the CISO or an external auditor and you want to look at you know what is the compliance view of of this cluster of the operations whatnot uh, you know at least having a standardized reportable uh, you know result is is a good thing. Yeah, and that's basically just an API definition, which me means yeah. it's super open to whoever. Maybe. Um, I don't know that I want to commit. Does someone want to own starting? Uh, is this a cap the right place to kind of define this API or this idea or maybe just uh, some kind of doc thinking about this? Yeah, we can start a Google Doc which takes, you know, the policy violation, the CRD object that we demoed and at least captures what that has and why we have you know, like, so the inter some of the interesting things we encountered with like, um, you know, controllers like deployments and things like that, and what would be the right way to report violations on them. So certainly we could take a stab at that. That would be awesome. Yeah, that would be great. All right, so sh shall we wrap up the meeting? Uh, it's time. Right. Yeah. Clap okay. Um, <laughs> uh, next, you moved to the meeting last today. We're in that weird week, and then next week, are you going to move it back? 
No, uh, it's uh, uh, like before KubeCon, we want to do like week, uh, do a weekly. Oh, no, 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 no. I mean for the hour, for the hour. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Uh, what do you guys think? I mean, if you want to leave it the earlier, that's great for me. It, you're the one I think who the, has the worst kind of <laughs> how early is up to you. Yeah. Do you want to check that next week isn't ridiculous? <laughs> <sighs> So, uh, for you guys, that'll be one hour like late or earlier. I I never earlier. So it's fall back, spring forward. <laughs> so can you do like one hour earlier? Uh, that it's fine for me. The time yeah. it's, but uh, is that is that okay for you? What's on your calendar? Yeah, that work for me. But uh, I don't know, folks okay. on the west coast. 3 p.m. Okay. Cool. Then, uh, okay, let's uh, change it to one hour earlier, starting next week. Yeah, I think you just can leave the invitation alone then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't have to do anything. Yeah, I think so. It, it's target uh, uh, Beijing time, I think. <laughs> Cool. <laughs> okay, thank you guys so much and uh, see you guys next week. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Come on.